Hi, and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and part two of Ian's D-Day research. In this video, I'm going to look at the physical aspects of Gold Beach, the German defenders and the British assaulting forces. When I look at Gold Beach, it strikes me it has all the elements of the fall of the beaches, though nowhere near as extreme. It has a marsh, though nowhere near as extensive as at Utah. It has coastal habitation, it's nowhere near as built up as at Sword Beach and to a lesser extent as Juneau. And it's backed by high ground, though nowhere near as steep or as close to the beach as at Omaha. The features of Gold Beach are summed up nicely by this passage from the official history. The coast is low-lying and sandy, offering no such natural obstacles as the bluffs of the rock-bound shore which stretches from Aramanche to port de basson in the western half of Gold. Only low sand dunes fringe the shore of Jig and King, but there are soft patches of clay in the tide-washed foreshore on which heavy vehicles will be liable to sink and behind the lateral road, which runs near the seafront, much of the ground is soggy grassland, crisscrossed by dikes which must hinder movement. Jig Beach could be covered by fire from strongly defended positions at Le Hamel and anel sur mer and from a smaller strong point near La Roquette. King Beach was protected by defences at La Riviere and by strong points at Harbour de Herto on the coast and on the higher ground near Montfleury and Versumer. mer the whole front between Le Hamel and La Riviere was defended by beach obstacles and by a continuous belt of mines and barbed wire. As I describe the defences on Gold Beach, do bear in mind that I am talking about Hitler's Atlantic Wall, but the images we see or with the perception we get of the Atlantic Wall is of massive concrete construction with huge naval guns in them. That's around the Pas de Calais. That is where the Germans expected the British to attack, the narrowest part of the channel. Defences in Normandy, something different. Um, they are of a lesser design. There are bunkers. Gold Beach has a large bunker that held an 88mm gun. But the majority of the defences on Gold Beach are like field positions. They had concrete, small concrete uh, emplacements for infantry, like to Brooks. But the majority of them, it's a little bit like fighting in the First World War. They are trench positions with small concrete bunkers in, wired all the way around for defence. They aren't the massive constructions that you see further up north. So, along the shoreline at Gold Beach are a series of field fortifications. Some bunkers, fortified houses, etc. But the threat to an assault force doesn't start at that shoreline. The Germans recognised this, and behind Gold Beach and over to the west, they'd emplace four batteries of large guns. Beyond Aramange, over on the west, is Longchamere Battery. Four 150mm German-built Czech naval guns in large concrete cassion. Still there today, you can go and visit it. Fascinating place to go to. The guns are still in place and actually rusting away, but I'd highly recommend a visit. Where it's placed, it can fire on the fleet over gold, or it can fire at the fleet off of Omaha. Behind Gold Beach, on the slope overlooking the beach, is Montfleury Battery for 122mm old Russian guns. And then behind, on the east of Versamare, out of sight of the sea, is La Mer Fontaine battery for 100mm Czech guns in for concrete cassion. The defence of Gold Beach came from the low grade 716th Static Infantry Division, composed of, according to one German general, of old men, and it also included three Ost or East battalions of conscripted Russian and Polish personnel. On D-Day, three companies of the 736th Infantry Regiment manned the shoreline defences with the 441st Ost Battalion in Versamer and Crepon and in reserve 726th Infantry Regiment. Their one role on D-Day was to hold that beach, those hold those beach defences until the reserves and the reinforcements could come up. 
as well as their small arms, their rifles, their grenades, their machine guns, their mortars, their weapons also included 20mm and 50mm guns and the aforementioned 88mm gun sat in its bunker right on that shore front. There is one more infantry division that needs mentioning. In. The 352nd was a relatively new field division, 12,000 strong, built around a corps of veterans from four divisions shattered by fighting on the Eastern Front. Its role was to man the defences from Le Hamel westwards across, including Omaha Beach, train and also strengthen the beach defences. It also established a strong mobile reserve of a couple of infantry regiments and 10 Stug assault guns, the only armour to confront the British west of Caen on D-Day. The landings on Gold Beach were the responsibility of 30 Corps and their commanders allocated that initial task to the 50th Northumbrian Division. Having already fought in North Africa and on Sicily, the 50th were probably one of the most experienced units to attack on D-Day. Two infantry brigades were used in the initial assault, the 231st and the 69th, and these were ably supported by units from the 8th Independent Armoured Brigade, 79th Armoured Division and the Royal Marines Armoured Support Group. 8th Armoured were equipped with two versions of the Sherman tank, the 75mm armed standard model, capable of penetrating the German Panzer IV, but were found to be ineffective against the heavier Panther and Tigers. The British therefore developed a stopgap to overcome these heavy tanks. The Firefly was a Sherman fitted with a 17-pounder anti-tank gun. They were extremely effective, but were produced in smaller numbers. A standard troop of tanks contained one Firefly, two, three, 75mm Shermans. The support, supplied by 79th Armoured Division, was of a different nature. Known as Hobart's Funnies, after the commander Percy Hobart, the division was equipped with a range of specialist tanks designed to overcome beach obstacles and defences. I won't list the whole range of vehicles they had, but I'll just mention three that would prove very useful on Gold Beach. The Churchill tank was a platform for many of the Funnies. It was heavy, it was well armoured, it had really good cross-country performance, it was ideal for operating at the front of the advance. Churchill's carried a lot of equipment, bridges, fascines, flamethrowers, as well as the following two variants used on Gold Beach. The base vehicle was the Avery or Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers. The obvious difference between this and the normal combat version was its armament. The main gun was replaced by a petard mortar. Though not developed specifically for the Churchill, it was this weapon that gave the Avery its designation once it was mounted with the turret. The 290mm mortar fired a 20kg bomb known as the Flying Dustbin. With a range of 100m, the bomb was sufficient to demolish concrete bunkers or earthworks. In many ways its greatest vulnerability was that reloading could only be achieved by pushing the charge down the barrel which expected to expose the crew member to enemy fire. I'm pretty sure an enemy soldier seeing one of these being loaded in order to fire at the bunker he is in is going to make killing that crewman a priority. With Gold Beach concealing patches of soft sand, the Churchill bobbin was a useful piece of kit. An Avery had a 10 foot wide reel of reinforced canvas mounted to its nose, which when unrolled by the tank driving over it, created a temporary road surface. The reel could be jettisoned once empty to allow for normal Avery activities. The Crab was a minefield clearer. The best in a series of attempts to fulfil this role, the Crab was a Sherman fitted with a powered spinning drum fitted with chains that flailed the ground in front of the tank to explode mines. As can be seen, the Crab could still be used as a normal gun tank. The Royal Marine Armour Support Group operated the Centaur close support tank, armed with a 95mm howitzer. 
All these units, together with the Sexton self-propelled guns of the Royal Artillery and the two reserve infantry brigades of 50th Division, form the largest divisional group in British Second Army, in all some 38,000 men. I hope you've really enjoyed this video and it's whetted your appetite for more. The next video I'll do will be a bit of a short one and I'll detail the pre-landing joint fire plan and then on video four we'll have a look at the initial phase of the landings on Gold Beach. So please give us a like and subscribe, keep watching and I'll see you soon. Bye!